just wanted to recognize and welcome everybody who's joining us from Torah High School, from who live from around the world at the moment, from England, Baruch Hashem, and from other places here in Eretz Israel. So we're waiting. Uh, you know, everybody who was on time, I think uh, we'll, we're gonna we're gonna start uh, sooner rather than later, and uh, we'll have questions at the end. Um, this is part of an ongoing uh, effort by Foundation Stone, uh, the organization that Barnea and I uh, are, have been making attempts to uh, keep alive for the last uh, 30 years. And uh, um, the, the goal here is to uh, make Torah, archeology, span Jewish history uh, relevant uh, <laughs> to various educational tracks. And uh, primarily uh, in this case, uh, to do something that hasn't been done before, and that is to allow Jewish teachers to get their teeth uh, into why the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls should be relevant to them, what they can take from it, what they can understand. So without further ado, Barnea, please introduce our guest speaker. I will, but I will remind you, please mute, please mute everybody. I'm going to do that. Except right. for me. Yeah. <laughs> so... The Dead Sea Scrolls, many people uh, consider to be the most fascinating find in our, but the point of the TORCH programs is to help educators. And so we thought, let's ask Professor Lauren Schiffman, Larry Schiffman of New York University to discuss the Dead Sea Scrolls from this context. And he said, I never talked about them before. This is the first time I'm addressing it. He's spoken to students before, but this is a unique context. So just to mention his official position is the Judge Abraham Lieberman Professor of Hebrew and Judaic Studies at New York University and the Director for Global Institute for Advanced Research in Jewish Studies. And he was recently at, at, at YU. But I, when I was working on a paper on the Dead Sea Scrolls, I went to conferences and I got to ask him and the others. His, his words are taken very seriously. And even when people disagree with him, they disagree with him. I think generally respectfully, but I'll let him uh, discuss that. But he, he, he has a, uh, a voice in uh, this field with the sensitivity of the Torah learning behind it. So Professor Shishman Larry, it's an absolute pleasure to welcome you to the Torah Archaeological Program of Foundation Stone, which is located now in the cloud and no particular place. Thank you very much for joining us. Okay, I think I'm unmuted, right? You can hear me? You're unmuted. Yes. yes. Okay, so in a second, we will have a screen. At least we should have, because now, right, the screen is not... There we go. Okay, got it? Okay, we're in business. Almost in business. Now we do slideshow. This is why I actually try to do this all the time before we start. Our hosts preferred that you should watch this action of getting this thing going here. So just for those of you who don't know that the last conference I was on with Professor Schiffman, he was talking to 850 people. So this will be shared with many educators who, who cannot listen right now, but you really, you're listening to somebody very experienced in doing these conferences. Go ahead, Larry. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. So let me just say, first of all, that I, I, I realized, uh, that besides the educator here, educators here, there are some non-educators or let's say non-classroom educators. I wanna say first to the classroom educators that while I have had experience speaking to kids from middle school and high school about the Dead Sea Scrolls, which I think have gone pretty successfully, I have to admit I have never successfully done your job. And for that reason, I'm not gonna sit here and tell you how you should teach a class regarding the Dead Sea Scrolls, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through a group of uh, slides, if I can use that old-fashioned word, which I always show when I speak to school groups. And I'm going to explain to you what I emphasize and why about the scrolls when we're trying to use the scrolls as a tool in Jewish education. Now, obviously, when we do that, we want to present the basic information and the truth about what they're, why they're interesting, et cetera, but we want to accent certain areas that uh, will cause the students to realize Jewish continuity in certain ways. 
and realize that what the scrolls show is a tremendous amount of what was going on at a very important time, time, time in Jewish history, but they also provide us a kind of concrete example of various Jewish ritual objects and, of course, of texts that we know. So that is the point, but I always start by speaking to them first about the archaeological part, uh, site of Qumran. Now, this is important for a lot of reasons. By the way, I'll just tell you that this aerial picture was not taken by me. I once almost had the chance to take an aerial picture of Qumran. And that was because someone wanted to film over Qumran. And when they tried to get a permit, the permit people were in cahoots with a company that sells footage and therefore told them, well, we, we could give you a permit, but it's so much cheaper. Go to this company and buy the footage, which they did. So I lost the time, the opportunity to fly over Qumran myself in a helicopter. Now, the point, however, is that what you want to uh, show them about the site is not the site itself, because let's face it, to these students, this particular place is not the most important thing. The first thing is to frame for them the historical context, because one of the problems that we have is that the entire period between the Maccabean revolt and the destruction of the temple in 70 is a blank to most children because of the way Jewish history is taught. So you have to start with the question of what is really the aftermath of the Maccabean revolt. And remember that the aftermath of the Maccabean revolt is not what everybody thinks, because in 164 BCE, when you had the rededication of the temple, the uh, Seleucids and the Hellenists came back and basically kicked the, uh, the Maccabees out of the Beit HaMikdash Yehuda dies in 160 fighting in the Judean wilderness, and only in the time of Yonatan, Jonathan the Hasmonean, in 152 BCE, does the empire really get started, what we call the Hasmonean Empire, and lasts to 63 BCE, when it gets destroyed by the, uh, I'm sorry, when it gets uh, replaced by Roman domination. Now, the point that I want to make here is, that here we're looking at approximately that period because the Qumran sect is going to come into being sometime in that uh, era in the aftermath of the uh, of, of the uh, takeover by Yonatan the Hasmonean. My own view is that what happened is that some Sadducee priests left and formed the sect. There are other views about how it came into being, but whatever the case is, it's first appearing in, jo in our sources. Josephus first talks about the Pharisees, Sadducees, the Essenes, whether they are exactly the scrolls group, or they're a wider group, whatever it is, in about 150 BCE, when talking about Yonatan taking over, which we date to 152. So that's, I think, the buildings and the, the, the construction of the place gives us a chance to emphasize the general historical background, and then the sectarian nature of the group that occupied this uh, space here. We're looking south. Now, something that has to be made clear to students, whenever you show them any archaeological remains, is you need to show them sometime what some kind of reconstruction, even if it's not a good one, because otherwise they think, what do you mean? These people lived in these little huts where they had no roof and they had you know, broken down walls. They don't realize that these were fancy buildings in antiquity, beautiful buildings. That's a point that I think has to be made to students all the time, because simply they're so used to seeing ruins especially if they're already at the age when, you know, we're teaching sometimes in Jewish education, kids who've been to Israel five times. And they've, they've seen all these places before they're 14. It sounds funny, but it's actually, it's actually true. You know, when you ask kids who's been to Israel. So at any rate, that's an important thing to, to realize. Now, of course, the archaeological dating of the site, now we think the most accurate thing is that the sectarians came there in about 100 BCE, which means the group split off earlier than that. Soon after the Maccabean revolt, we think again, when Yonatan took over in 152. So if you hold that view, you have to realize they didn't quite come to Qumran at the very beginning. They came there after they were somewhat established. Now, I don't show, when I speak to uh, ch uh, children from Jewish schools, I don't show so much about the archeology. span I just want them to realize the character of the place and what it was like. But immediately, you're now looking at a mikvah. 
Now, it's true that some scholars want to claim that this is something called the Roman steppe pool. But can you guess the only places where you can find Roman steppe pools in the world? You can find enormous numbers of them in Eretz Israel, and you can find them next to a few synagogues, like in Ostia, for example, in Cologne. So they can call it a Roman steppe pool or they want it to mikvah. And uh, we, of course, know that's a big, but by the way, uh, I have a certain things that I teach every class, no matter what. And I always tell my students that a don alum does not mean master of the universe. It means eternal master. I finally convinced the RCA translation has that in the new sitter. And I also tell them that the word is not mikvah, V-A-H, it's V-E-H. Now, my daughter built one, and I couldn't convince even her to call it an M-I-K-V-E-H. I didn't ask for a Q, as scholars would do. That would be insane. And of course, you couldn't find it in the phone book. But she told me you couldn't find it in the phone book with M-I-K-V-E-H, which is crazy, because if you look up M-I-K-V, there's not another word in the phone book. And there's no phone book anymore, so it doesn't really make any difference, right? But uh, what we used to call the phone book. So having said that, Right, for whatever it's worth, you can tell the students because most of our students are also in, in Hebrew text and stuff like that in their schools that the word is mikveh, even if the plural is mikvaot. But uh, skipping the grammar lesson for a second, here is a chance to tell students how a mikveh works. Now, you have to be careful about one thing. In antiquity, there is no such thing as an otsar, a collection and a second mikveh next to the first. Yigal Yadin in Masada goofed. The type of mikvah that is used today in most places, which it's also an opportunity to show them, is built with two pools at least, sometimes three. And there's a certain way in which the second pool, called an otsar, allows you to empty the mikvah and clean it, etc. That is an invention of what became with modern plumbing. The whole thing has been uh, documented by... Uh, in, 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 in two different contexts by Jonathan Adler, who was a scholar at Ariel University, and by Shalom uh, Bear Levine, who is the librarian of the Chabad Library in New York. And both of them independently documented this in different works they were working on, that it was, it, it was invented uh, in the time of the Khatam Sofer. So you have to explain to them that this mikvah doesn't work like a modern mikvah, that has two pools, the one maintaining the water, the mikvah water, or the other one being used to, uh, to refill it. But rather what they had in antiquity, for the most part, was either a pure collection on the spot or a collection, as you have at Qumran, through a complex water system of aqueducts. Not aqueducts, those giant things like you see in Caesarea, but the small aqueduct, which is really just a, a kind of a, a pipeline, and, and they are arranged in a direct flow, such as it's kosher from the halachic point of view, but again, it's not made like the modern mikvahs that you will see today. Now, here is a cistern. This ha cistern happens to have a crack from an earthquake in 100, uh, in, in uh, I'm sorry, in 32 BCE. 32 BCE, there was an earthquake, uh, I have no idea who those people are, but you can see the crack in the uh, there from the earthquake. Now, the point about this is that if you are dealing with the students, and this is probably not going to happen, what I'm about to say, but even in the university, you wouldn't do this except in graduate school. If you're reading the account of Josephus of the Herodian period, you'll see that Josephus discusses the earthquake. And this earthquake, which happened in 32, 31 BC, actually, this earthquake, here you see the archaeological evidence of the earthquake at Qumran. So this is just a kind of a side issue to show the extent to which some of these uh, accounts, for example, Josephus, have a lot of accuracy despite the problems involved. For example, Josephus later on trying to justify his own role in the revolt. It's a chance to tell them about Josephus too, because Josephus describes the Essenes, and the whole discussion of whether the Essenes are the Dead Sea Scrolls sect or not is, uh, gives you a chance to jump off and tell students about Josephus and maybe discuss uh, some of the things about his life and the things that he, he wrote and, and he did. Okay, now, 
Another piece of physical evidence for Judaism is tefillin. And here you're looking at a head tefillin, which has four dividers, like uh, a modern, uh, you know, four sections, like modern uh, tefillin. Now, here's a chance already that you have to explain to students to get to give them the true picture of the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's necessary to explain that these are not the predecessors of the Prushim, the Pharisees. And therefore, for that reason, we shouldn't be surprised that while some of the tefillin are made exactly the way it's tefillin are made that we use today, there are some tefillin that have additional passages. Now, some of them, as, as people point out, have the Ten Commandments. Now, why does this happen? In those tefillin which don't have exactly the same passages as our tefillin, they may start above or below the section that's required. They all will have the required section, but if you start above Shmai Yisrael, which is chapter 6 in Devarim, you will get chapter 5. Chapter 5 is the Ten Commandments. So here's a chance to explain to them that Second Temple Judaism had types of Jews that are observing the Torah, but in ways that are somewhat different from the way the Prushim of the forerunners of the Talmudic rabbis. Now the immediate question will be, oh, right, depending on where you live, uh, in America it would be asked, right, is this like, you know, OU, Chabad, and Satmer? In Israel, it would be asked, Datiim, Karedim, uh, Litaim, right? Now, however it would be asked, right, it, it isn't totally the same because of certain major theological differences. But on the other hand, it's very much the same. And uh, I think that's something which needs to be explained. And of course, Second Temple Judaism differs from the modern Jewish period. Because in Second Temple Judaism, almost all of the groups that matter are trying to live according to the Torah. They just have a different view of what the Torah requires, as opposed to the modern period in which you have either, in some cases, you have some people who think it's not necessary to live according to the Torah, or you have the strange phenomenon of, I agree with you that the Torah requires, I don't eat this, but I'm eating it anyhow. Uh, it's a different situation. But nonetheless, it's a comparison that allows a lot of opportunities to get into the discussion of how do we relate to this notion of different kinds of Jews and offering different kinds of Jews that are in agreement with basic traditional observances, yet have sometimes some very, very different beliefs. In the case of the Dead Sea Scrolls group, they're probably the ultimate of the closed off type group. There was some study done by a scholar comparing the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls to Naturi Karta. Unfortunately, the problem with the entire thing was that the guy read one Naturi Karta pamphlet. But with a thorough study of the Naturi Karta, it might be quite an interesting discussion of how, we, how these Jews are situated as the ultimate closed off Jews who physically had to leave the main Jewish center because they couldn't take it. But on the other hand, they're still keeping Shabbat, they're still putting on tefillin, they're doing all the things that they're supposed to do. I cannot tell you what they would have done in the pandemic. We don't have that information. Now, just to show you while we're here, the strap goes on the bottom. The film is sewn together, so it's missing the base. It's off our subject, but people talk all the time about Rashi and Rabbeinu Tam regarding the order of the tefillin. But actually, Rashi tefillin are a cube with a little place for the strap to go on the side. And Rabbeinu Tom's tefillin are the ones that have the base, which is typical of all of our tefillin. So he have an opportunity to get into using the Qumran tefillin also as jumping off point to talk about what are the ways tefillin are made, what are the different opinions, and um, people will always ask the question, what order are these in? This particular one that you're looking at in which we do know something in the order is like Rashi with the inner two flipped, but we don't have total views about this topic because many of the fill-in for Qumran were all broken apart when they were found. And you may have seen in the papers that there are a few fill-in from Qumran that haven't been opened yet. They're trying to figure out some scientific way to properly open them without destroying them. These are very small, by the way. These are three-eighths of an inch, like the old German fill-in. 
if anybody has seen those type of filling. And the reason is that the Qumran people wore the filling all day. So they had to have filling that didn't take up, uh, you know, that weren't too large. Now, here is just a piece of the writing. Let me say, I want to point out that this is an interesting thing. Here you see something that looks sort of like it's regular, but there are a lot of crazy shapes and written on scraps and written on both sides in ways that would never pass today. And uh, this is also an opportunity to point out to students that a lot of the regularization of Jewish ritual that happens in the rabbinic period was not there in the second temple period when we're talking about here, when a lot of these things are just becoming stabilized. But for me, the big deal here is that you can, just like the mikvah here with the filling, somebody questions, you know, what is the continuity of Jewish tradition? And here you see somebody in front, in front of you is doing the same thing that's being done today. Even if it is a little different, you know, what's the difference if it's a little different? But it's the same basic idea that was being done in antiquity and being performed here in almost the same way, which is a rather uh, amazing thing. Now, the other point I want to uh, go into now is when we hit the actual scrolls, again, one of the most important things to show the students is this continuity idea. But when you're showing them the continuity idea, you have to admit to them honestly that continuity also involves some differences. And that's the nature of the way Second Temple Judaism was. Of course, actually, if you think about it, right, even continuity today involves changes in history that people, uh, I don't want to try to go through examples now because we don't want to discuss the problem of modern, or whatever you want to call it, the history of modern Jewish observance, but I think it's fairly obvious to people that there are many things that are happening now, doesn't mean they're bad or something like that, but that represent developments in our time that were not the case uh, in, in earlier times. So uh, we shouldn't be really surprised about that. But nonetheless, the minute we come to look at the great Isaiah scroll, which is the one which is actually, it's the rotunda in the shrine of the book, but it's the only plastic in the entire shrine because it was deteriorating. So they long ago put in a, a, an imitation, a facsimile. But this that you're looking at is a picture of the real thing. Now here you have a chance to point out to students how much it looks like a modern Torah scroll. First of all, you have the intercolumnar margins that have been drawn. You have the, let, the lines with the letters hanging from the lines instead of on top of the line. This is why Dead Sea Scrolls are printed upside down. I recently got some something somewhere and it was, it was possible to fix it. I wrote the person and said, every one of your scrolls is upside down. Because in English, we write on the line. And in Hebrew, the original system is to spend the letter from the line. So therefore, they always get them upside down. Now, in fact, the person didn't even answer me in the last one I wrote to. I don't know why. Now, also, you can't see it here because the way I did the picture is no good. But the top margin is smaller than the bottom margin. All these rules, you see the stitching on the left side. These things are all almost the same as in modern Torah scroll. So here is another chance to show continuity, but then we got to be honest about something, that there are different kinds of biblical texts in the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is an example where the book of Yeshayahu was rewritten into the Hebrew dialect of the Dead Sea Scrolls sectarians. And you could show them a few examples of that dialect if the kids know Hebrew in your program, but basically that's an important thing to explain, that we're at the period where it's true that the Isaiah B scroll is almost exactly like our Masoretic Bible text, but we're at the period when there are circulating other types of biblical texts. And again, this gets into what kind of school you're in, whether you can teach this or not, because some people are afraid to hear some true information that may contradict their ideas, which is uh, a problem, okay? All you have to do is listen to political discourse today and you find out that lack of interest in knowing that there's any point of view other than your own has become very popular. And so uh, I, we shouldn't be surprised that maybe we Jews came first, right? We first popularized the idea of, uh, you know, I, I, I couldn't care less what the other guy thinks, I'm always right. But if, so jokes aside, right, the, uh, we have to sometimes, if we can, explain to the students these issues about the biblical text Still coming now. When we go to Masada and the Barkovka caves, we only have what we call the proto-Masoretic version of the text. Now, 
Moving along, however, here we have another really interesting example. This is a piece of the Psalm scroll. Now, I told you that I don't have never really had any experience in teaching children, but I've given a lot of lectures to children about the Dead Sea Scrolls on the junior high and high school level. When I go to a day school, I have the same scheme. I told you that these slides I'm showing you now are the ones that I usually use. It's a short presentation, and that's why I thought it would be good to use it for this presentation. So let me explain to you something about what I do. I come in there, and the first thing I do when the kids come in the room, I have them receive a piece of uh, a uh, script table and a piece of this scroll. The piece of the scroll is Psalm 145 plus two introductory lines. I won't ask if anybody here knows what Psalm 145 is, but you certainly know the introductory lines because it's what we call Ashrei. Now, Psalm 145 starts, our, uh, starts Tehillah with David. In this particular text, instead of Tehillah, it says Tefillah, a prayer to David instead of a praise of David. And what I do is I hand out to the kids as they come in the script table and the photo of the scroll. And, you know, it used to be in black and white. Now you can do it in color. And tell them the first thing we're going to do is we're going to decipher a scroll. When you figure out what it is, you tell me. Okay. Now, it doesn't take too long before a clever kid figures out from the first words, once he hits Tefillah of David and it gets starts to Romimcha, he starts to figure out what it is. So I let them all continue doing it, and they discover very quickly that there's a refrain between the lines. Now, this scroll is supposed to be a psalm scroll, but in reality, it's a Jewish liturgy type text. And between the lines of Ashrei, right, you have this this, this kind of uh, what we call in fancy language a doxology, right, which is Baruch Hu, Baruch Shemo, right, this kind of thing, Leolam Va'ed. And one by one, the kids discover what's going on here, and you could see that Ashrei was essentially, Psalm 145 was being used for liturgical purposes in 100 BCE or something like that. There's a lot more you can show with this particular scroll. Like, for example, you have the bottoms of the scroll have been destroyed, and you can see that it rotted on the bottom, and the divine name is written in the old Hebrew script, which you can show them and discuss what is the old Hebrew script, why does it exist? As you see what I'm saying, you can use the scrolls to drive, because of their fascination, to drive, or the fascination with them, to drive Jewish history lessons, lessons in the, in the, about the Tanakh, again here, lessons about the old script, lessons about the sitter, all these things can be driven from the scrolls, and you see it here with this, with this particular document. So this actually is just a small piece of the scroll. It's much longer. It's often exhibited because it makes a nice thing to exhibit, and people recognize a lot of the Psalms, especially Christian audiences, and if Christian audience start to quote the Psalms, and a lot of the people just know it all, know it all by heart. So at any rate, um, I actually have in my garage <laughs> rolled up a like 30 foot high replica of Shira Malot, right? Uh, you know, Ezri uh, Mia Machema, Seshemayim Varus, et cetera, right? So I have a 30 foot piece of that, of this scroll in color, in plastic, which I don't know what to do, but I couldn't resist taking it when the Dead Sea Scrolls were being exhibited in New York. Uh, because it's just a beautiful thing, and it was made, but it's a repli it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, you know, a reproduction. But I don't know what's going to happen. Okay, now what am I ever going to do with it? I, if I have an or if I had an office with a thirty foot high wall, I would be able to use it. Now here we have a piece of Sefer Vayikra, where the entire this is the whole the whole scroll is the whole book is on this scroll, and this illustrates another phenomenon. It's all written in the old Hebrew script, the one that was used in the first temple time. But on the other hand, and you can teach that script too and let them decipher a piece. But on the other hand, it is letter for letter almost our Sefer Vayikra. So here's your chance to explain to the students, you have this continuity, but we are dealing with a sectarian group. There are certain things that they have which differ. There are certain things other Jews had which differed. 
because in some extent, Second Temple period is a period in which traditions are coming together and in which things are being solidified so that all together they will start to constitute the, the Judaism of the rabbis when that becomes completely solidified in the Mishnah and on afterwards. Larry, okay, please, just, Larry please explain the term sectarian. Oh boy, this is a hard term. You know, it's funny we use this term, but we use it all the time. So what we mean by sectarian in the case of the scrolls is they, they pertaining to the sectarians who lived at Qumran collected the scrolls. Now, this is it's a good, very important question. I would have come to it later. So let's for a moment just talk about this whole question. This is a piece of your Jewish history part of this, what the scrolls lead into. And that is that the history we know from about 150 BCE, Josephus tells us there were three major sects, Pharisees, Sadducees, and Essenes. When the scrolls were found, many, many scholars simply assumed that they were Essenes. Now, we're not going to talk now about the people who thought they were Christian and stuff like that. It's all interesting, but it's really nonsense and not relevant in the Jewish education scene, although you do need to know because some kid will raise his hand and said, but my mother said that the Dead Sea Scrolls are Christian, so now it's time for a funny story. When uh, my uh, oldest daughter was 15 years old, she went to a friend's house. Now, she knew that her father studied the Dead Sea Scrolls, but she didn't really know very much about the Dead Sea Scrolls because it's like the shoemaker's child, children who don't have shoes. She never wanted to hear about the specifics of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And here she's sitting at Shabbos lunch, and the father of her friend says, oh, yeah, the Dead Sea Scrolls, that's really interesting. So that somebody else at the table says, well, what is it? So he starts giving him all these views of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are in complete disagreement with me. So she comes home and she says, you know, Mr. So-and-so explained all about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Just tell me what he said. I don't agree with anything he said, right? So this is the, the funny part of this, these problems about who are the Essenes and all that. But you know, some kid is going to raise in and say, my father said the Dead Sea Scrolls are Christian. Why are we studying them? Or some other nonsense. So you will have to know something about that if you teach about the Dead Sea Scrolls. But I don't want to spend my time talking about it. By the way, I also didn't want to spend any time today talking about the non-publication and the scandals and who's drunk and who's an anti-Semite. You have to decide all the time what you want to spend your time doing. And that's really a, a waste of time, uh, even though it's very interesting, I must admit. Okay, and if you want to know more about that, you can read my book, Reclaiming the Dead Sea Scrolls, and you'll, you'll find out enough of the dirt at the beginning to have a sense of what was going on. But that's all over with anyhow. So now to get back to the point, so if the Dead Sea Scrolls are the Essenes, then we have no problem with them in history, and when we say sectarian, we mean Essene. You know, we don't know the word Essene. The word, we don't know what it means. It doesn't appear in Hebrew. It only appears in Philo and Josephus. Now, because of that, never appears in the Dead Sea Scrolls, does not appear in the Talmud, does not appear in the New Testament. So I don't know how important these people really were, but Pliny the Elder says that the Essenes live on the shore of the Dead Sea above Masada. Now that does sound like Qumran. So I have put forward the notion that the sectarian group was formed when a group of Sadducees left the temple. So when we say in the field of Dead Sea Scrolls something sectarian, we mean about this particular group, who many think are the Essenes, for which we really can't prove 100% that they're the Essenes. The majority view is the Essenes. I have a lot of question about that view, but that is the majority view. But now, that is not what we mean when they use the noun sect to discuss Second Temple Judaism. We use it in a way that sociologists of religion don't like, because sociologists of religion say that in order to be a sect, there has to be a church. So what do we mean by that? Let's use England as an example. It's easier than some of the other countries. It's obvious that the United Synagogue of England is official Judaism. That's the chief rabbi that gets invited by the queen, et cetera, et cetera. That's the church, the official religion. The sect in England right, is the so-called, well, you have two, sect, two organizations. 
You have the Federation of Synagogues, and you have the Kedasia. Kedasia is the equivalent. I mean, I guess the Federation is the equivalent of what in America is called yeshivish, and uh, which is not like Litai in Israel, contrary to what people think. And the uh, Kedasia is Hasidim for the most part. Now, the point I want to make is those groups in England are clearly the sect. They're the people who chose not to affiliate with the mainstream church. So now we don't use that the term that way in Second Temple Judaism because it's generally believed that either that there is no, <laughs> it's funny to use this expression, church, no mainstream, or that the mainstream is the kind of temple and what we call common Judaism, and none of the so-called sects is that mainstream, even though they all share the common Judaism. And this is a whole set of contradictions, I know, because they're groups that are considered to be separate, but they all share in common all kinds of beliefs and practices. So what that means, however, is that when we say the sect in Second Temple Judaism, we're talking about the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, the Dead Sea Scrolls people, whoever they are, they're all called sects, as if there, as if there is no mainstream. But there actually is a mainstream, but it's a mainstream of the things these people share and which are practiced officially in the sort of official Judaism of the country. And this is complicated to understand. So when we say sectarian, the adjective, however, we're usually talking about material in the scrolls that comes from the sect. Now, important point. So since there's a common Judaism, we have to tell you now, there are three kinds of, you push me now into stuff, not from talking about what I tell kids in the school, but the general lecture on the Dead Sea Scrolls, but uh, there are three kinds of materials in the scrolls. Number one, text of the Hebrew Bible. Number two, what we call apocryphal literature, which means anything like the Bible or about the Bible. And number three, sectarian texts. Sectarian texts are from this particular group with the animosities and the terminology of this inner group. But the first two are common to Jews in Second Temple times. So the, the Tanakh, the Bible, and the apocryphal type texts about the Bible, like the Bible, were also found, for example, at Masada. And this is because they're being read by people all over the country. So these constitute the common Judaism type texts, as opposed to the group three, of which, by the way, there is a slide right in front of you because the thing on the on the uh, screen now is a piece of a pesher. Pesher is a form of sectarian biblical interpretation in which the Bible is interpreted as if it's referring to what's going on right now. And that uh, type of material we call sectarian because it's specific to the Dead Sea sectarian group who may or may not, depending on, on what your opinion is, be either the same as the Essenes or a subgroup of the Essenes. But anyhow, that I think is a fair summary of what we mean when we say sectarian. Okay? Now we'll leave this. Now this is actually fa a fascinating text which I show you again because of its value in showing students up front things that are real. This is a scroll that is called a scroll of Devarim. Deuteronomy N, but it's a question whether that's really what it is. At the beginning, you have Devarim Chet. So everybody should know Devarim Chet because it's the command to say Birkan Amazon. It says there, you shall eat, be satisfied, and bless the Lord your God. So that's the commandment to make the bracha. However, the second part of the text is the Ten Commandments. But it's not a regular Ten Commandments. People call this the earliest Ten Commandments. When this was in New York at the Dead Sea Scrolls exhibit that was held in Times Square, during the, this one piece, the so-called earliest Ten Commandments, was there between Christmas and New Year's. It took an hour and a half wait to get into the exhibit and an hour and a half wait just to see this one item. When I heard it was like that, I was generally going there like every week for something. So when I heard it was like that, I had to get down to the, to the exhibit again and see it. I couldn't believe it. Lines, hundreds of people waiting to see the earliest Ten Commandments for 10 seconds. But I'll tell you that when you take a look at this thing, it has a fascinating element. And this, again, shows you a Jewish continuity. Everybody should know there are two versions of the Ten Commandments. 
There's the one in Exodus and the one in Devarim. The one in Exodus says you have to keep Shabbat because of the fact that you, uh, God created the world in seven days and he rested. And the second Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy says you have to keep it because you were slaves in Egypt. You have to give everyone a day of rest. What this guy did was he mixed the two into one. By mixing the two into one, he made a combined Ten Commandments. Now, why is the combined Ten Commandments so important? Let me explain. Because we have in the Jewish liturgy two very important examples of mentioning the combined Ten Commandments. The first is Kiddush, Tehillah, right? Lubikrai Kodesh, Tehillah Namase Breshit. I'm sorry, Tehillah Namase Breshit, right? And then, right, Zechah Litziat Mitzrayim. So first we say it's remembrance of creation, then we say it's remembrance of the Exodus. That is the same statement that is in the Midrash that Shamor v'Zachor v'Dibor Echad Namru. That the two versions, the one that starts with the word Shamor and the one that starts with the word Zachor, that both of them were said simultaneously. And this is repeated in L'Chad Udi. Shamor v'Zachor v'Dibor Echad Ishmiyana Weil Ayufam Yuchad. That God gave us this unity of both versions of the Ten Commandments at the same time. Now, exactly how the rabbis interpret this is an opportunity to teach about that but it's an opportunity to show how the motif that the two go together, even though textually, and this is a very important point, the rabbis would oppose messing up with the text of the Bible and rewriting it to make two versions of the Ten Commandments into one combined. Even though that's the case, the motif that underlies this thing is a motif that uh, is found in Judaism running all the way up through the Kiddush, which must have been sometime from the rabbinic period, running up through the Chadodi, which was from the 16th century. Now let me just tell you something really funny. This picture you're looking at comes from a children's book. When the Dead Sea Scrolls had not been published yet as a whole, somehow or another, the Israel Museum got the hands on this picture to put into a children's book on the alphabet. And it was an unpublished text, but you could buy it in a children's book. It just shows you the strange things about the whole story about the publication of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, then another piece of the Tanakh, just showing you a piece of Tanakh, this is a piece of Daniel. I'm not so sure. You know, most Jews don't read Daniel, which is too bad. If you just tell them exists a book named Daniel, you know, I don't know what I want the kid. In, no kid in high school has ever seen Daniel. You know, I want to tell you something funny. My experience when I teach in the university is that all the kids who went to Jewish education of any kind they only know the first seven or eight chapters of every biblical book. So if something happened in say, in the book of Joshua, in chapters one through eight, they know about it. If something happened in Judges one through eight, they know about it. First Kings one through 10, they know about it. Nobody's ever been to chapter 24 because they never made it to chapter 24 in school. And while this is not the, uh, the point for me to tell you, but the fact is people who are teaching in Jewish schools should make a choice and not just go in order and do whatever the first 10 chapters are. If you're not going to have enough time, which of course you don't have, to cover an entire book, ask yourself what are the key things that I think the students should learn about and pick those out and teach them. So, it, but, but when it comes to Daniel, I'm not sure it will be much hope. Okay, now we reached a, a very important area, which is the existence of books at Qumran that, as I said, are that second group. They're like the Bible, but they're not the Bible. And here we have example of the book of Hanoch, Enoch. Now you have a chance to tell kids all about the Jews of Ethiopia and how texts were found in Ethiopic translations based on the Greek. And now we know that those translations are fairly accurate because we have in the case, for example, of Enoch and Jubilees, we have numerous manuscripts. The other thing is that this book is in Aramaic, and there's a chance to tell students about how Aramaic relates to Hebrew and something of the history of Aramaic to have an understanding. Now, I know that 99% of these things has no, no time for them in anyone's curriculum, which is a shame, but that's why sometimes if you do a little unit on the Dead Sea Scrolls, you could go into some of these areas around it and give the students a chance to know something they wouldn't otherwise know. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit to the sectarian scrolls. Now, the sectarian scrolls 
I think we have to, again, take an honest approach. We need to show the students that we have here these very dedicated people that are going, basically most of them leaving their homes to go live in on the shore of the Dead Sea. Most of them are men because very few women and children were buried in the cemetery in Qumran. And while some people have claimed that the sectarians were celibate, it doesn't really appear to be the case, but nonetheless, the center at Qumran was apparently used by men as a kind of study center and the, the graves are, are mostly of men. But at any rate, I would make the point of explaining to them that when you study the texts like the rule of the community, which you see you hear, see in front of you, or some other texts, you will come to the conclusion soon that there was a level of fanaticism here that's overdone. While these people left us a tremendous library of scrolls, they also, if we're honest about it, and I think we should be honest with the students, they had some crazy ideas. Now, one of the crazy ideas that they had was that there would be a war at the end of days in which everybody would die except those who joined the sect. Now, this is not like, let's say, when the Rambam says there's going to be war at the end of days, he means that the, 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 the evildoers will be destroyed by the, by the rest of the world, the good people. So it's sort of like the war on terrorism, where there's an assumption that there's a very small number of bad people that the world would be better off without. But in the Dead Sea Scrolls sect, it's all reversed. We, the sectarians, are the only ones who are going to survive in the end of days when everybody else is killed. So, and then, of course, this is the ultimate of believing only you are right. So there are places here to discuss fanaticism with students. There are places to discuss tolerance. And there are some very beautiful passages in the scrolls that we could sort of slip into the High Holy Day liturgy, no one would know the difference. And, and they're beautiful, and they, they express very important ideas. But there are other places where the scrolls have a hatred of outsiders and certain other things that, you know, it's a chance to discuss. How do we relate to people with whom we disagree? Which, again, is a topic that it seems from what's going on in, in, in our own era needs to be uh, talked about much more. Okay, this is another piece of that kind of Pesha literature, which is an independent type of Dead Sea Scrolls interpretation, when the Bible is being interpreted as if it applies to our, our own day. Now, I think it's necessary to point out to students, provided that you don't get thrown out of your school for being considered a left winger. So I once pointed out that Josephus was right. And that the revolt was a very, what he said after the revolt, because he participated in it. But he was right because he, he, he pictures various views that the revolt is a fiasco because the temple is going to be destroyed. And of course, all the revolt did was to destroy the temple. It didn't do the Jews any good. Jews, unless he wanted to move to Rome as a slave, it didn't do him any good. So, so I pointed this out in a lecture in a shul somewhere, and somebody came up to me afterwards and started accusing me of being a, a, a fanatical leftist and stuff like that, you know, the new AOC of the past, right? And uh, of course, this is ridiculous. Josephus was right about it. So I point out to you that today we sometimes have to part explain to people that the prophets have not exactly foretold our days. And quoting the prophets in order to decide your politics regarding Israel, its relation with the United States or its Arab neighbors is not exactly how you should go about making decisions about what you think we should do. But that may be dangerous because you may be told that you're a left-wing fanatic. So I'm not sure if you should, but it's one of the lessons of studying the patient literature. And you can see, right, if I can pick up the pointer from over, give me a second. Yep, we got the laser pointer. Okay. Now you can see right over, where is it? I had it a second ago. The divine name of the old script. Yep, now I got to find it again. Here we go. Right above the laser pointer, you see the divine name of the old script. Now, this is interesting because the rabbi said that if you do this, the text isn't holy. But nonetheless, the Dead Sea Scrolls sectarians apparently believed it was more holy and not less holy. Okay. Now, this is another one just to show that the, the nature of some of these texts, this is the commentary on Nahum to show you how, uh, you know, extensively destroyed it was. You know, here I want to tell you, you get to the uh, question 
of sometimes the extent to which you want to tell the whole story. Because this text tells the story about how the Pharisees invited the Syrian ruler to attack their own country during the time of Alexander Yanai. And they came in and, and were destroying Jerusalem. And then they had to try and fight against them. But, but it was a terrible story of people who, because of their hatred for the King Yanai, went so far as to invite an enemy. It's sort of like if the party that lost the Israeli election were to then go to King Hussein and convince him, King Hussein, he's dead, King Abdullah, <laughs> sorry, King Abdullah, and convince him to attack Israel militarily because they don't like the guy who got elected. I mean, this, this is like, uh, this is what happened though. And we know the story from about 88 BCE or so from Josephus and from the Dead Sea Scroll. Okay, now you see a very beautiful text that has been crumpled up like you throw things in the garbage. It's called the Hodayot. Now here, I don't know if anybody's really going to talk about this in a classroom, but let me explain to you that this text has beautiful, beautiful Hebrew poetry. And as we have gotten more scrolls and as the entire scrolls corpus was published, we now know that they had beautiful poetry. And since the history of Hebrew poetry goes after the Bible, it goes to the Dead Sea Scrolls, from the Dead Sea Scrolls to many of the prayers in the prayer book that are already in rabbinic times were being composed and that are poetic. Like a, a very good example is Lakel Baruch Nimo Itenu, That's a type of ancient poetry composed in rabbinic times. That's a poetry from rabbinic period. And then to the poetry of Kalir and Yanai. And of course, Kalir has so much in, in from the fifth century. By the way, it's not really our subject, but uh, Elazara Kalir lived in the 500s. And the whole debate about when he lived is pure stupidity because he tells us when he lived. In the keynote for Tisha B'Av, he says it's 900 years since the destruction of the temple. And since he thought the destruction of the temple was in 424 BCE, if you add 900 to 424 BCE, you'll see that he was living in the, uh, in the, in the 500s, in the 6th century. So we know exactly when he was living. He told us in his own words. So if you open up an art scroll see door and they tell you he might be a Tana or he might be uh, living in the Middle Ages, this is all just stupidity. And then it, it keeps going on for reasons that I'm not really sure. But anyhow, so Kalir is the next step after that kind of poetry of the Sidor, and the step before the poetry of the Sidor is Dead Sea Scrolls poetry, and the Hodayot are a great example. Of course, you can joke with your students about the Hodayot being the prayers, they call it the Thanksgiving scroll, for the holiday of Thanksgiving. So once I went to visit some people for Thanksgiving weekend over Shabbat, and uh, the Gabai of the synagogue was pretty clever. He didn't ask me in advance. He announced that an hour before Mincha, I would be giving a lecture on the Thanksgiving scroll. Now, I've been joking about that for years. And this guy actually went ahead and did it. So, of course, I gave the lecture. Everybody had a good time. But um, it, it's, it's, of course, not about Thanksgiving, but it does begin, most of the poems begin, I will give thanks unto God. Now, this, as I say, can show, there's certain things in here that feel like it's a high holy day liturgy. But there are things in here that we don't agree with. And this, again, gets to that point of how you explain to students that the very same group of documents that shows us the continuity of the Bible, that shows us tefillin, mikvahs, all this kind of stuff, that Jews were living, you can see Shabbat laws, which are very similar to many of the laws of today. All these things, you show them the continuity, and yet at the same time, there's a discontinuity, if you want to call it, because there are differences of opinion here. Now, the, uh, this is another interesting text. It's a mystical text, another one for this continuity things when you have a high school. Most places you can't really talk about this, though. The people have to know quite a bit because this points towards certain aspects of Jewish mysticism that are found in the later Hechalot mysticism and then in even in the Zohar and other later Kabbalistic texts. Okay, now you're looking at my favorite scroll, the Temple Scroll. Instead of talking to you now, I am supposed to be proofreading the Temple Scroll, our new edition of the Temple Scroll, which is at press with thrill, and we got the proofs a few days ago 
And uh, um, that's what I was supposed to be doing today, right? If I knew that I would be getting them now, I would have told you to schedule this lecture a month from now. But what can you do? We didn't know. And uh, this is a rewritten Torah, which is loaded with all types of laws and legal opinions of the author. And it's an absolutely fascinating text, which would be a whole other lecture. Now, I want to get to what I think is really the last important point, and then we'll close and take questions. Because this is the so-called MMT text. This unlocked a very big mystery for us. This text shows, again, a number of things that are very important for Jewish education. First, my view of this text is, and I don't say everyone has to teach it, but my view of it is that this emerges from the schism in 152 when the priests who don't think that the Maccabees are right who are following the Pharisees when they go off and they start the Dead Sea sect group. But the one thing that's about this group with this text, which is unquestionable, is that the writers of this text espouse Sadducee views and their opponents are described by them as espousing Pharisee views. Now, you may know that there are some modern scholars who think that all of the material for the Mishnah was invented after the destruction of the temple. This was the view of Jacob Neusner, as if there was no second temple, period. Now, one of the things that we learned from this material, especially when you study the MMT text, it has a number of the controversies that exist in rabbinic literature between the Pharisees and Sadducees stated as we versus them, with the we of the text representing the Sadducee view and the they of the text representing the Pharisee view. Now, it's not necessarily because the text comes from Sadducees, but it does show, as do many other texts, that the halakhic system of the Dead Sea Scrolls sectarians is the system that was the same as the Sadducees. And furthermore, and this is really important, not only this text, but many other Dead Sea Scrolls texts represent arguments against views that we see in the Mishnah, which is edited in about 200 CE. So what it shows in, you have a scroll from 120 BCE that is arguing against a practice and suggesting a different way of practicing that given thing, which is known to us only from the Mishnah, and the argument is taking place now in 120 BCE, it shows us that many of the things in Mishnah Kalacha go back to a much earlier period, to at least we can push them back to 120 BCE or so, and often these are things that people have been, have been some people have been arguing are actually later. Okay, the war scroll from Qumran, this is a whole other subject. They expected that war in the end of days, and that's what's found there. Now, what I want to do is I want to make a conclusion and then open up for questions, if that's good for our chairs here. We've been talking for about 55 minutes, and uh, people can only listen to so long in front of Zoom, although they listen a lot longer than some people think. But uh, having said that, what I want to sum up and explain to you is that if we, there, there's two separate ways to approach the whole question about the Dead Sea Scrolls in a school curriculum. One is that we simply decide that we're going to have a one-week unit on the scrolls and what they teach us about the Jews and the history of Judaism. And, uh, you know, if you have 35 minutes, like a Jewish day school, period, so you ought to be able to get in what's the history, or does it tell us about Jewish history, which is good, because you can talk about the Maccabean Revolt, you can talk about what happened after the Maccabean Revolt, and then you have the question, how does it show us continuity of Jewish ritual? You can come with a bunch of subjects like that without too much trouble and find some very good material. However, I think for most people who are teaching in Jewish schools, they're not going to do that. They're going to be able to throw in remarks here or there. So what I tried to show you is that the scrolls touch on virtually every area that you could be teaching about. One could be teaching Sidor and explain to them that some of the things in the Sidor have parallels in the scrolls and mention something which takes five minutes to mention. And one could also be teaching about Hanukkah and say, well, by the way, you should know 
that soon after the story of Hanukkah that was established as Median Empire, and this caused some people to protest, and that's why we have the Dead Sea Scrolls with all these ancient biblical manuscripts. And in a Bible course, you could, Tanakh, showing Tanakh somewhere, you could pipe up and say, well, you know, these scrolls are very ancient. We have these books existing in Dead Sea Scrolls, etc., etc. So I am not uh, silly enough to believe that people are suddenly going to start teaching Dead Sea Scrolls instead of Chumash in a Jewish school. But I think there are a lot of opportunities to mention it. And I think that one of the most important things is to give the kids an upfront experience of the reality of some of these practices in antiquity. And we didn't even talk here about Shabbat law and about holidays and calendars. There are a million things. And even when the scrolls partly disagree with the way we practice and what we understand because we follow off from the Pharisee way, nonetheless, there may be things here which will teach lessons that will be valuable for the students in terms of the continuity of Judaism over time, and also in terms of the elements of the common Judaism that existed at that time. And as I said, just the idea that you can see in front of your face all scrolls of the Bible and see mikvahs, fill in, all kind of other stuff, right? I think there's a lot to be to be gained from that experience, the extent in which it's possible to duplicate even outside of Israel and in some Jewish classroom somewhere. So with that, I would like to say thank you and open up for questions. And I would unshare my next step over here. Larry, that was fantastic. Thank you. Very, very helpful. David? We have a couple of questions, Barnea, that were in the, put into the chat. Let's start with that. Okay, we'll I can see you're right. I didn't read the chat while I was talking. Oh, that's fine. But Okay, so the first is from Ruhama. She says uh, she wants to make sure she understood correctly. There was no such thing as Otsar in Mikvaot until yeah, the Khatam Sofer. Yeah. You see the question, Larry? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, let me tell you, this is... Let, but let's say, let's say it aloud, because this is being recorded, and not everybody will see it. So she's asking, but there's a, it seems to be an Otsar in the Herodian quarter, this pool's next to it, and the number of excavations, Second Temple period, it would seem that there is a pool next to the mikvah, yeah, so, so here, she's asking. Here is the point. There are many mikvahot in the Second Temple period that are built in pairs, and they're built right next to each other. And this caused a lot of people, even though they couldn't find the tube connecting them, to the assume that there was an Otsar. Now, the problem with the assumption of the Otsar is the following. Let's just remember what the purpose of the Otsar is. The purpose, which I said very quickly, is that I have a pool full of mikvah water. And I have, I'm going to purposely state it this way, I have modern people who aren't interested in going into some place where a lot of people have been uh, there for the last eight months since the rainy season. So what do I do? I empty out the mikvah, and then I turn on the faucet. And the water to fill up the mikvah, depending on how I built it uh, and how I'm doing it, will generally flow, right, either over or through the Otsar, or, depends how we do it, we may just fill up the mikvah and then open a connector with the Otsar. This can't be done without plumbing. You can't fill a mikvah in a day to refill it and use the Otsar to kosher it in ancient times. It requires the invention of modern plumbing. And yes, it is true, contrary to what people thought, and there are scholars who've written all kinds of articles identifying Otsarot. And if you go and actually look at the material, you will see that it was literally being discussed as a modern invention in the 19th century, and it did not exist until then. That is true. And I have to tell you, I must admit I was skeptical when I first heard it, but it is true. It is a great example of the phenomenon of how halachic principles guide things, but then when the technology changes, things have to be done differently. It requires a plumbing technology with water under pressure that you can stream in to the mikvah to then use the Otsar water to join to it and render the whole thing kosher. 
And if you don't have plumbing, you can't do it. So it happened when the pipes were put on. So let me just tell you, all European mikvahot, before this idea was invented, were based on either groundwater by digging way, way down till you had water you know, under the water table, or the most common were building the mikvah next to a river where the water would be coming in from the river and would be the natural river water and the whole problem didn't exist of cleaning the mikvah and all this kind of business. The old mikvah out in Eretz Yisrael were filled by rainwater in the rainy season. And if you study the Mishnah and Gemara, you will learn uh, the tremendous amount, the Mishnah mikvahot and various other places in the Gemara because there is no Gemara and mikvahot, you will learn about all the concerns about the dirt that floated in it and all the other problems which are a result of the fact that they didn't have a plumbing system. So yeah, that is the answer at, at length to that question. Fascinating that question. Okay. Um, which revolt was Josephus say was no good for Josephus? There was you no, know, yeah, he's talking about the great revolt against Rome. It, it's not just no good. What happened is, I, I said it quickly, it's a problem of talking about all these side issues, but that's why we need questions. So the, uh, what happened is like this. Josephus was actually a failed general or colonel, whatever you want to call him, in the beginning of the revolt when he was assigned to the Galilee. And he failed, and the Romans overran him, and, and Yod fought. We talked before about the keynote. If you have a keynote that says your fought, I can guarantee you the name of the place is Yod fought. So in Yod fought, at the, uh, where he was in that situation that he describes where they drew lots, sounds like Masada, preparation for Masada, they drew lots for who would commit suicide. And uh, he was one of the last two guys, and they decided to surrender the Romans. From that point on, he's outside the wall begging the people to surrender. And he quotes his friend Agrippa, Marcus Agrippa, who gives a big speech to the Jews about why it's insane to re revolt against the Romans. Now, everything in there is true. That is to say, all of the negative results that they, which I don't want to say prophesied, but foretold about the revolt happens. And we've destroyed the temple, destroyed the people, hundreds of thousands of Jews sold into slavery, all kinds of money stolen from the country so that there apparently was an inscription that the money of the Jews paid to build the Colosseum. So this was a fiasco. So uh, I, I want to point out, it's not our topic. The first temple and the second temple were both destroyed because of the actions of, of basically right what we would call right-wing fanatics. I'm sorry to say that, but this is the truth. So when you explain this, you can be called a heretic in many Jewish certainly orthodox circles, but we do have to, people say this stuff about, you know, history repeats itself. It doesn't repeat itself, but we do have to learn the, the results. Now, but they, were def they were definitely right-wing fanatics because there was nothing left. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but were, were you, are you referring to the Hasmonean revolt? No, no, the Hasmonean, revolt, the, the Hasmonean revolt, the problem, the Hasmonean revolt was not that. That's the point. We're referring to the great revolt against Rome. The revolt, the revolt against Rome and the first temple, the first revolt, first temple destruction and the second temple destruction. Uh, you see that when you read the story of Gedalia, what happened to Gedalia? He was assassinated by maniacs who had, didn't understand it was the last chance for any Jewish independence. And these people were maniacs to assassinate him. Of course, he was tipped off and he didn't listen. That's another matter, right? He, he made a mistake. He didn't believe it. But uh, the reality of the situation is that uh, that's what happened. And we have some good questions here, which we need to uh, answer over here, I think, still, right? So I think we somebody... covered the questions in the list. If anybody has a question that they well, want to raise, I, I post. Sorry, yes. Yeah, so, somebody asked me a question, which I posted. What texts were you referring to that espouse Sadducees' views? Okay, so the, first of all, the one I showed you, it, actually, it's all over the Dead Sea Scrolls. So let, let me explain one technical but very important example that I call a smoking gun for Sadducean point of view. There is such a thing as a tful yom. A tful yom is a person who immersed on the last day of a purification ritual. And the Torah says, Uva shemesh v'taher. Now, we would assume that that means that the person remains impure until sunset. 
Now, that is actually not the Pharisaic view. The Pharisaic view is that if such a person has completed the required sacrifices for their purification ritual, and then besides completing the required sacrifices, the person has immersed in the mikvah, or in the case of impurity of the dead, been sprinkled by the waters of the paraduma, with the ashes of the paraduma, that person is now okay for, let's put it in the simplified way, everything but eating sacrificial meat. Now, the problem with that is that view of the Pharisees is opposed by the Sadducees consistently. The Sadducees don't accept Tabul Yom. They say, until sunset, nobody is pure. Every major one of the halakhic texts from the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Temple Scroll, the one that's called the Damascus document or was originally called the Tzadokite fragment, the MMT document, they all have the principle, like the Sadducees, that until sunset, there's zero change in status and the person is totally impure. That is a smoking gun for, Far for Sadducee and Halakha as opposed to Pharisaic. There are nine examples in the scrolls that show that principle. Then we can get numerous other examples. The most famous example of all is the, fame, is the example of, of Nitzok. Now, Nitzok is when war is, water is being poured out. So here I have a cup. And if I pour this water down, make believe I have a vessel down here. And I don't have it because I'm sitting at my desk. I just have my cup full of water. But if I had a vessel down here, make believe that vessel's impure. Does the impurity go back up into the top vessel? Now, the Prushim hold that it doesn't. The Sadducees say that it does. And the Dead Sea Scroll text, the one we call MMT, says it goes back because it's one stream of liquid. It goes backward up the top. Now, the halakha of the, is that for purification rituals, it doesn't go backwards. That's the Pharisee view. But the Sadducee view is in Dead Sea Scrolls, which is that it does go backwards. Now, furthermore, I just want to point out so no one should get this wrong, Kashrut, the, the, the halakha is, is that it does go backwards. Okay, so if you have a dairy pot and you pour into a chicken soup, right, the chickenness, the sari, goes back and you have to kasher the pot if it's hot. Okay, but nonetheless, right, in, in Tuma Vitara, purity and purity, the halakha is that it doesn't go upward the stream. And yet the sad, sad you see view is that it does. And I could go on like that with numerous examples. Let me mention something which is more significant than any one of these little examples we're talking about. If you go to the temple scroll and you see the concept of sacrifice and concept of temple, you can see that to them, the temple is the only real good way to connect up with God. And of course, much of the view of the Prushim, especially when the temple is destroyed, and then Tvila and Torah and become much more important ways of connecting up with God in a way that, that really, but on the other, it's not that they ever negate Korbanot, but you could see somehow for these, these people are influenced by the Tztuki method, the, the Korbanot are more central. It's a question of degree. Now that's hard to believe since most of the Mishnah is about Korbanot. After something funny, which is people talk about, you know, uh, the you know the Dead Sea Scrolls are very big, they're very priestly, and they're very Korbanot-like, but they forget that most of the Mishnah is about Korbanot. You don't realize that. You're part of a Masechta. You know, what is Masechta Shabbat about? This is a real wise guy question. Most people say it's about what you're allowed to do on Shabbat, what you're not. It's not. It's about when do you have to bring a Korban Chatat? Over and over and over. Chayav Pator, Chayav Pator. What's Chayav in Pator? Chayav to bring a Korban Chatat if you did it by accident. Pator from bringing a Korban Chatat if you did it by accident. That's the whole subject of the, not the whole, it's the subject of 90% of the Mesechta. What's the subject of Sukkah? What's the Psachim? It's all Korbanot. So we have to be careful not to fall into that trap. But nonetheless, the, somehow there is a, and I'm going to give you a great example. So when you go to the buy kosher meat, you're buying what's called shkitat chulin, non-sacral slaughter. I hate the word profane slaughter because profane sounds like obscene. So I don't use that word. 
right? Profane slaughter. It's in a lot of books. But anyhow, so when you buy a piece of meat, that's shchitat chulin. If it was a sacrifice, it would be shchitat korashim. The Dead Sea Scrolls in the Temple Scroll, which represents this very priestly point of view, forbids all shchitat chulin unless you live three days' journey from the Mikdash. If you're not three days' journey from the Mikdash, you got to make a korban shlamim every time you want to eat meat. So you got to come to the Temple, and then you got to eat it in Yerushalayim. You can't even take it home if you don't live in Yerushalayim because shlamim korban has to be eaten within the walls of Yerushalayim. So the, the bottom line of what I'm saying is that there is a much more intense, first of all, specific Sadducee halachot, and then on top of it, you have the Sadducee priestly you know, temple ideology is being given. That doesn't mean they are the Sadducees, but I think it does mean that they started with a group of Stukim that exited the, the, uh, the, the temple. Okay? And by the way, just one more point. If you study the temple scroll and the biblical interpretation that underlies halakhic material on the scrolls, you can understand the more literalist approach of the Tzuki Derech to understanding the halakha of, and you can get a lot out of that. Wow, that's fascinating. Rucham is asking, how widespread was having extra scrolls in the refill? And do you find Pharisees doing the same in Tefillin? No, Yogi is asking that. Extra scrolls? Yeah. Wait, 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 wait. How is having extra scrolls in the refill? And do you find Pharisees? I don't know what the refill was. That's supposed Sorry, to be the refill was an auto text mistake. How often do you, how, how widespread was having extra scrolls in Tefillin? Well, you have to understand, we don't have a lot of scrolls. Find it amongst Christian. But we have, we have, okay. So, first of all, we have 20 something Tefillin from Qumran. Remember, you said extra scrolls. I think someone said that. There are no extra scrolls. There are four scrolls. It's just that when I write the one for a certain thing, I might have more psukim below or more psukim above. So it's the same four. It's just with more or less above and below. Mm -hmm. Second of all, we don't know anything about the Prushim except that we observe from the, from the Mishnah on that the filling is the same as what we the ones we have in today. As far as the Dead Sea Scrolls are concerned, there are two kinds of filling in Qumran. One with extra, one without extra. But there's only 20-something filling in Qumran. Once we get to the filling of the Bar Kokhba caves, they don't have anything extra because they are, let's call them total Pharisaic filling. But some of it's filling it the Dead Sea Scrolls are what we call sectarian filling. We use that word because we see we have two, but we're talking about like, ten, talking about what would have been if we could put them together properly, 10 pair of filling we're discussing here. So, you know, it's like taking a survey and announcing who's going to be prime minister when you ask 50 people. You know, I mean, it's, you have to be careful about that. Well, Churchill went to war because he asked the people in the subway, but yes. Um, <laughs> Ruchama Alter is asking, is it, uh, you just should know, Larry, these little tidbits that you just throw off that line, Bar Kokhva's like this, that's so valuable. That's so I valuable. Know. I don't know. Yeah. I'm telling you. I'm telling you both as a, a teacher and as a tour guide. Ruchama Alter asks, is it impossible to argue that the Dead Sea Scroll pe people had some laws same as Sadducees, but were still a different group? Are there laws that differ even from those of the Sadducees? So first of all, yeah, if you, if you take the Essene theory, then you're going to argue exactly that. You're going to say that these people have the same halakhic of derech as the, as the Sadducees, but they're not them, because these drachim, or whatever we want to call them, were wider than the specific groups that we know about. So that's the first thing. So the answer is yes, it's 100% possible. And that's why the simplistic assumptions that people make are often wrong. And a perfect example about that is the difference between the average people that Josephus said followed the Prushim and that they weren't card carrying Pharisees, you know, that registered and they didn't pay their dues to vote in the primary. Now, so when we come back now to the, the, the question of what, what really we don't know about this is what was going on with all the different groups of Jews. So let me make one other point. You look at the screen and you all see some pictures and some black spaces. Imagine that we want to know about Second Temple Judaism. By the way, in my classes, I don't allow any black spaces. It's okay for a couple of minutes if somebody has to get up or they want to eat the sandwich, 
but I want to, they got to show their face. However, the thing is that if you imagine instead, let, let's say you have my picture and the whole rest of the screen is blank. That's the problem of Second Temple Judaism. We think we know a lot of stuff, but we know a very small minority of what was the totality of the thinking and the text and the life of the time regarding many of these religious issues. And we are extrapolating from what we know, so we often cannot rule out possibilities of things that might be true and might not be true. So I often say to students when they say, could it be? I said, if you're in this class and you've been doing the reading and you ask if it could be, the answer is always gonna be yes. The problem is, do we know if it is? And very often we simply don't have the information. So when we get you know, to later on, and I just was spent four days at a conference on John the Baptist. Now, if you look up somewhere in uh, Wikipedia or something, read all the passages about John the Baptist. Now, can you imagine, we don't know anything about John the Baptist. We think we do. And look how important he is in the Christian story. And we know like next to nothing about the guy. So the point, and we had four days of people, some of them making up a lot of baloney about him, and some of them explaining how little we know. That was the two themes of the papers. It and, was immersive. Yeah, it was no joke. We spent, I, I, the, the, nothing you can know about John the Baptist that I didn't learn in the four days. However, the point that I really want to make about this is that it shows you the example of the difficulty of knowing so much stuff about this period and why people should not talk as if we know everything. There's a lot we don't know. That's there also a very good opportunity to introduce to people a question of how do we know what we know and how do we not know what we don't know? And this, it's very clear that there are many, many Americans who have no idea how, I hate to say it's a horrible educational failure that people went certainly to high school, in many cases to college, and do not know how to know where to get sources of truth and where you're getting sources of baloney. And that is really a problem, but it's a problem in history also when we study ancient history. To not know that we don't know everything is a big mistake. And is, what we know is a minority of what must have been at the time. That's very healthy. This has been wonderful. I'm glad you touched on Tuma and Tyra because the opportunity, David, yep. yeah. David, please, I have, go ahead. I have a two-part question. Um, first of all, uh, just in all of the literature, I'm noticing, at least where the pictures were clear enough, that there are sirtut in all of the scrolls. Almost. Not all. Not all. Lines. lines. So, Making okay. lines. Inscribing lines, lines on the Lines into the scrolls, right? Is that is that typical of the scrolls? Yeah, yes. And, that is typical of the vast majority of scrolls. And the second sometimes question we is... Sometimes we can't see it anymore. So let uh, me widen your question or your point. The scribal traditions of the Dead Sea Scrolls mostly match the ones of the later rabbinic tradition. These were the Jewish scribal way you do business, so to speak, how you create scrolls. However, there's one big difference. We have no full Torah scroll at Qumran. We only have manuscripts which show either one or two books together. Now, you probably saw an article in the papers that someone determined that the way they determine the length of scrolls is wrong, and it could be they could have a Torah scroll. That's fine. But we have so many examples, and we don't have a Torah scroll. The second part of the question is, um, I would love to hear your uh, assessment that what we're looking at is a Gniza as opposed to a library. Yeah. A when they were first discovered, yeah. so Sukenik called them Hamagilot Gnuzot. And the first two books that came out were called that. And that word stuck. You do not call them Migilot Midbar Yehuda. I'm sorry, you don't call them Midbot Yamamela. Today you can call them Midbot, uh, Migilot Midbar Yehuda, the Judean desert text. You can't say in Hebrew, I mean, you can, but you should not say Megillot Yam HaMelech. Now, but his title, Megillot HaKnuzot, some partly sticks, but not so much anymore. Now, he thought it was a Geniza. What's the problem with the Geniza? The problem is that in a Geniza, you put things that you're not using anymore. 
it's very clear that these texts were used over a very long period because many of them have corrections or repairs. So it doesn't look like a Geniza. Furthermore, there are 11 caves that had scrolls. In most of them, they weren't even a library. They were hidden at the end when in, in, in 68 CE, the Romans destroyed Quran. So they were being hidden at the end. So that being the case, what we're talking about here is that somebody had a collection of works they were using and threw them in a cave for safety. Now, we also know that Cave 4 must have been a library. It had over 500 or close to 600 scrolls before they deteriorated over the 2,000 years. Now, that must have been a library. It had shelves. The shelves were, or you can see the holes from the, where the shelves are attached into the walls inside K4. Now, the point here is that therefore it must have been texts which are in use. So the Geniza theory is very out of vogue. I had a guy from uh, who lives in Lakewood, he called me up and said he wants very much to come to see me. He has a great solution to the Dead Sea Scrolls. And he dreamt up the idea that a Geniza and he drove two hours to see me at NYU. Very nice guy, nothing wrong with the guy. The only problem is he could have saved a lot of time because uh, the last time someone did that, it's the worst case. This I'll tell you a funny story. A guy told me that he's, lives, he's somewhere in Virginia somewhere. He has to come drive to NYU because he wants to show me a scroll that he thinks is a Dead Sea scroll. So the guy comes all the way from Virginia to New York in a terrible rainy day. And another guy comes, a second guy is supposed to come, but doesn't come because he's coming from Vermont and the storm, he can't drive and the whole thing. And a guy gets there. So he starts in with these pictures, which he thinks are a Dead Sea Scroll. It's a Torah scroll. And it's a Torah scroll from after the 16th century, after the 15th century, after the invention of printing, because previous to printing, the left margin in a Torah scroll is not 100% straight. And once it's 100% straight, it's because they're imitating printing. So he shows me this 15th century Torah, 16th century photo of Torah. Okay, so I explained to him why it's a bunch of, it's not that. Then the truth comes out. Listen, I got a deal for you. If you can give me $1 million of NYU's money, I can get you $10 million. Can you imagine this guy is dumb enough to believe that some professor can give you away a million dollars of the university's money? Forget that you got to be an idiot to believe he can get you $10 million in a month for the hand. But leave that aside. He thinks he drove all the way from Virginia to think that a professor in New York University could give him a million dollars of university's money. I felt sorry for the guy. Not that he didn't know a Torah scroll, but it was really a thing that's such an idiot to think that that's possible. I mean, I I could give him a million dollars of university money. So anyhow, so okay, we have any questions left? No, I think just, just thank yous. Yeah, Just I want. First of all, I want to thank you personally on my on behalf of myself and Barnea. This was very informative, and if you look at the chat, you'll see that people are deeply appreciative. Yeah, I saw some nice chats over here. Nice I'll, I'll just here. I'll just end with one quick little anecdote. Barnea and I had a meeting at the Israel Museum a number of years ago. It's over a decade, and uh, I, I was in charge of two of my my smaller children at the time. And um, we sent them to uh, go check out the Dead Sea Scrolls in the, in the Shrine of the Book. Well, we were in the, in, the, uh, in the main part of the museum. And anyhow, we came back, we came out of our meeting and they're already there. I said, you already saw the Dead Sea Scrolls? I said, Abba, there were no squirrels there. There was absolutely no squirrels. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I, okay, so now no I got No living tell you. squirrels and no dead squirrels. So, I have so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, in the spirit of your story, we once had a babysitter who asked me, oh, you study the Dead Sea Scrolls? You mean what they eat? That's the same, <laughs> the same, the same, the same the, joke. The same, the same, right. Anyhow, yeah. so thank you very much. This was very informative. And you, many you of the people triggered were... some other topics that we would probably like to explore with you in the future. Oh, okay. so, and, uh, and, and the questions were for people in the future. There was a, a Torah high school principal, there was a community rabbi, a few community rabbis, and tour guides here. So you helped a lot of people, and the recording will help further people. So okay. Professor Larry Schiffman of New York University, thank you very much. 
And if I can help you proofread the Temple Scroll book, I'm pretty fast. I do it professionally. You can shift some over here because we took up your time. I'll give you some of my time. <laughs> I think if you think, unfortunately, you have to have written it to find it's really our errors, not their errors that we're finding. So <laughs> thank you very much. Okay. Yofi, thank you very much. Thank you. And okay, thank bye. you to everyone who participated. Thank, thank you. you. Please hang up and try again.